All right. So today, we're going to take a look at the material in Chapter 4. Types of reactions, types of chemical reactions and solution stoichiometry. That the uh, last time in chapter three, I was telling you the stoichiometry, when you get a balanced equation, you can go mass moles, then moles mass. And that's true, that's still true. But the key to focus on there is the moles. If you've got moles here and mole, then you can go to moles someplace else. And uh, what we're gonna look at today is um, eventually, a stoichiometry where you start off with a solution and two solutions are put together and they react. That way, um, all you have to do is find out how many moles you're dealing with here and then you can move across to someplace else. Okay, so that's just a sneak peek. that out of the way. There we go. There. Okay. Um, we're going to start off with a discussion of uh, solids. And for our purposes, we're going to focus 99% of the time on water as our solvent. And that makes sense for a course, especially where we're dealing mostly with life sciences students. <clears throat> But we need to characterize the solid. And um, not to give too much away because we, we get into more uh, detail, more mechanistic approach for solvents in the second semester. But for now, it's sufficient to say that water looks like that on a molecular scale. It's a bent molecule, oxygen and two hydrogens. <clears throat> Actually, it's later in this semester we learn how to do that. How to, how to show that water is a bent molecule. Now, the importance of being bent like that is that there's a thing that we'll discuss later. It's called electronegativity. How strongly will an element draw electrons to itself when it's bonded to some other element? So the electronegativity here between oxygen and hydrogen Oxygen is more electronegative, so it's going to draw electron density toward the oxygen. And we use a small delta with a, uh, oops, with a negative sign. And then that leaves the hydrogens deficient in electron density. So you have a slight shift in charge over the old whole molecule. And to be consistent, I should put two there. What that gives you is a molecule that's polar. Uh, think of a magnet. Magnets have north and south poles. Well, we think of it in terms of electro, electron distribution. And if we have more electrons up here, if they spend more of their time here than they do there, that gives us a slight negative charge and makes it a polar molecule. And we use a, an arrow with a plus on this side because that shows us where the pluses are. And that's the negative side. So overall, the molecule um, has a slight negative charge on one side and slight positive on the other side. And that has implications for um, what things it can dissolve and what things it can't dissolve. Um, have you ever heard the expression, like dissolves like? No. <laughs> In chemistry, that's probably one of the first things we learn. Um, and what we're talking about is like substances dissolve each other, but it's based upon their polarity. So uh, polar or ionic compounds will dissolve readily in water. Uh, that includes uh, table salt. It's one, uh, it breaks apart into sodium and chloride ions. Or sugar, which has lots of hydroxyls sticking out everywhere. And I'll show you that in a minute. They're, they're polar just like this is polar. And the interaction between those polar molecules draws them into solution. Whereas nonpolar molecules like, uh, well, I don't know, oil, right? Oil is nonpolar. It will not dissolve in water to any 
a significant degree. Let's see, did I get somebody else? Yeah, Alexis. Okay. All right. So keep that in mind. This polarity of the molecule is central to uh, how water dissolves things, how it puts them in solution. Maybe I have to start that manually. Hope it'll work. This may not have any narration. Made in Canada. You can see it's got French and English both. So what we're looking at is sodium chloride on the right and the water molecules approaching. So how do they how do they interact with the crystal of sodium chloride? They do it because sodium chloride is a uh, an ionic compound. So the sodium is going to be the small red ones and the chloride is going to be the big blue ones. The chloride is negative, right? So the, the negative side of the molecule approaches the, I mean, the positive approaches the chloride and the, and the negative side approaches the sodium and pulls that crystal apart and just rips it to pieces on a molecular scale. And then once it, the ions are out there free, then they accumulate more water molecules around them. This is called a process of hydration. Here we go. The crystal is falling apart. Okay, let's see, is there somebody chatting at me? Okay, no problem. All right. So when we're describing the solution, we've got agreed upon terminology. The solute is the major component. And for aqueous solutions, we can assume it's going to be water. And when we write the compound in aqueous solution or the element, whichever the case may be, we use this designator after it. So if we said sodium chloride, in aqueous solution, that's the way we'd write it. And we knew it would not be a solid crystal, it would be in solution. And that's the, this is the solvent. Any other solvents, we uh, designate the solvent as the major component when you start dissolving something into it. The major component is the solvent. So if uh, we say water's the solvent, we start to add uh, sucrose to it, like table sugar, like we're making a hummingbird feed. And um, does anybody remember how much, if you make your own hummingbird uh, liquid, what's the ratio? One to one, right? One cup of water, one cup of sugar. <clears throat> so that's roughly equal amounts, right? So, which one is the solvent? Well, we, we assume that the water is the solvent in this case. In fact, that's a case where you can put more solute, a minor component, you can put more solute of table sugar in solution, then you have water eventually. You can make it that concentrated. But we still consider water the solvent. Okay? Um, another term, electrolytes. Those are the substances that are dissolved in water, and they're always the solute. The solute that dissolves in water and will conduct an electrical current through the water. Uh, how do we tell that? Well, the, I think the next uh, video will show you. You just have a completed circuit, except for the two electrodes that go into your solution, and they're not connected. So the only way you can connect them is through mobile ions, okay? And um, any substance that's dissolved in water and allows the conduction of electric, electric current is considered an electrolyte. Now in medical terms, 
they're sort of related to the medicals. Like if you get your um, blood or your analysis back from uh, whoever, I just got one yesterday from LabCorp, and it lists your electrolytes, and there'll be sodium, potassium, uh, magnesium, calcium, chloride, um, fl maybe even fluoride. I didn't see fluoride on that, but it, it would be an electrolyte in your sample. Come on. All right. So I do that manually. Now we distinguish between strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. Strong electrolytes typically are those compounds that completely dissociate into uh, their ionic components. Sodium chloride would be a good example of that. It completely dissociates, so it conducts electricity very efficiently. And if you if you connect your circuit through a battery and have a light bulb there, the bulb is going to be bright. It's going to have uh, maximum current flowing through the circuit. Weak electrolytes, on the other hand, will conduct electricity, but they don't produce as many ions for conducting current. So the current is decreased, and that little light bulb is dimmer. Okay, Non-electrolytes are those that, that do not conduct electricity at all. Table sugar would be one of them. You can put a lot of sugar into solution, but it doesn't ionize. It's the whole molecule goes into solution. All right. Come on. No, I'm not going to cooperate. My battery's not dead, is it? No. Well, I guess I'll just have to do it the old fashioned way. Elect electrolytes and non electrolytes are in this uh, video. We know from various lines of experimental evidence that solid sodium chloride consists of an ordered three-dimensional array of sodium and chloride ions. Solid sodium chloride is not a conductor of electricity. The ions of the ionic lattice are held in place by the strong ionic interactions in the solid and therefore are not free to move under the influence of the electric field. When sodium chloride is dissolved in water, it forms a solution of separated sodium and chloride ions. The presence of ions in the solution is responsible for the fact that the solution is a conductor of electricity. Substances such as sodium chloride that exist in aqueous solution entirely or nearly entirely as ions are called strong electrolytes. By contrast, an aqueous solution of a non-electrolyte, such as sugar, does not conduct electricity. We know from various lines... Oops. We don't want to watch that again. Okay. <clears throat> in order to characterize chemical reactions in solution, we put two solutions together. Um, first of all, we need to know the nature of the reaction. We need to know the components of the solutions so that we can write a balanced equation. This solution is added to this solution and makes something. We need to know the nature. what's the nature of the two solutions. Uh, and then we also know, need to know their concentrations. If we don't know the concentrations, then we don't know how many moles of each one is there. And if we don't know how many moles there are, guess what? No stoichiometry. We can't go to products. <clears throat> so we need a way of expressing concentration. Um, probably the most commonly used one in chemistry is molarity. And we abbreviate that with a capital M. And that's fair because there's no element on the periodic table with just one M. We got some M's and others, like MO from molybdenum. Let's see, what's another M? MT for magnesium. That's the first one that popped up. MN for manganese. But there's no one M, so that's good. One capital M is molarity. And what that means 
Uh, molarity is the number of moles, and there's my abbreviation for moles, right? little n, number of moles of solute per liter of solution. So that means if you have a liter in your possession and you know the concentration, you know exactly how many moles are there. And this is also an in, in, uh, intrinsic property. Uh, in other words, uh, it doesn't matter how much you have. If you know the concentration, uh, you could have 10 liters, 100 liters. It would still be the same number of moles per liter. And if you take out from a larger volume, a smaller volume, say 10 milliliters, then we can calculate how many actual moles are there because we have this ratio. It's a, it's a conversion factor. This concentration unit can be used as a conversion factor. And we'll do that. So our example here is six moles of hydrogen chloride dissolved in water to a total volume of two liters gives us a three molar solution. And this is this is critical. We're talking about the volume of the solution after you get the solute in solution. And solutes go into solution different ways. Some of them, um, if you have a, a volume of a solute, the volume of a, a solvent, you put them together, then their final volume, uh, more often than not, is less than the sum of the two. So think about it this way. When you put that solute in solution, where does it go? Well, if there are holes, it's going in those holes, right? And those holes were already there to begin with. Right? So it's taking up it's taking up space that was available, and that would reduce the total volume that you would get from adding both volumes together. That makes sense. So, <clears throat> so when you make up a solution, you want to be sure that the solute is completely dissolved in a certain amount of the solid, say water before you bring it to the final volume. I think I've got some slides on that, so I'm going to steal my own thunder right now. Okay, so here's a problem. If we have 500 grams of potassium phosphate, potassium phosphate, here's where you got to know your names and formulas. Right? You can convert back and forth between the two. Potassium, right? K, correct? Potassium. Phosphate is a polyatomic ion. That should be obvious. There's, there's nothing in, in this thing that's phosphate. There's phosphorus, but no phosphates as elements. So it's a polyatomic. So you look in your you look in your uh, table at the back of your right, back of your uh, well, if you're sitting in an exam, it'll be on one of the last pages. Find out what phosphate is and what the charge is. Right? Potassium is what charge? One, right? It's in the first column. It's an alkali metal. And you're pairing it with a phosphate, which has what charge? Do you remember? Three minus. Mm -hmm. Right, good guess. So all we have to do is balance the charge. Right? So we need three of these positives to balance that one minus, right? Three times plus one is plus three, and three times three minus times one phosphate is, is three minus, so they balance. That's the compound right there. Okay? We're going to put that in enough water, right? So this is the mass. We're going to put that in enough water to make a final volume of 1.50 liters. Okay. Now, is there any way we can, the question is, what's the molarity? Can we calculate the molarity from what we have up here? We can, but not with these values. This has to be converted to moles. Okay. So we've got this many grams. Okay. How do we convert to moles? Okay. Grams on the bottom, moles on the top, correct? And remember, when those two are in a quotient, think, Molar mass. What's the molar mass of K3PO4? Okay. 
think. So we need to look up. We need three potassiums. Let me look over here. I think it's 39. 39.10. So it's three times 39.10. And we have one phosphorus. Let's go ahead and do this one. 39.1 to two decimal places. This is 117.3. Um, and back into you too. No, I can't because it multiply. Four. Okay, four. Because we're going to have to add them together later. We've got to do these independently. Then one phosphorus, which is 30.97. Because we only got one of them, and then four oxygens. Yeah, one oxygen is 16, so four times 16 is 64, right? 64, 0. And that gives us 7, 12. 2, 12, 27. 2, 12, 27? Yeah. Okay. I'll take your word for it. So that's 2, 12. Well, let's see. We're limited here, so we'll make a point group. And that'll tell us how many moles of potassium phosphate we have. We need to divide by 100 by 2, 12, 3. So I get 2.3, 5, 4, 5 grams. That's you. And then waste of time if I get another grams. Okay, so now to calculate molarity is just moles of solute divided by the total volume. 2.355 moles divided by 1.5 liters. Okay. And let's see. Oops, I've thrown away a significant figure. So we can keep three of them, 1.57. Molar. Okay. All right, there we go. All right. Now throw a a, a fly in the ointment. Uh, this one uses calcium chloride, but why don't since we've already got this one, why don't we why don't we use the information we've got? That's 1.57 molar of the compound, okay? At that many moles of the compound in one liter. What if we need to know how many moles of potassium ions we have? Now we can do it just logically, or we can, we can actually, um, 1.57 molar compound, and we can say this, for one mole of the compound, how many moles of potassium do we have? Three, three potassium ions. So three times 1.57 would be 4.71 molar potassium ions, okay? Because this, this thing, it's going completely into solution. That means that if we have one mole of this, for every one mole of that compound, we have three moles of potassium. And that's its concentration. Now, why would that be important? Well, for a chemist, you know, there could be any number of reasons, but for a, a, a nurse or a doctor, it could be life-threatening. I mean, if you calculate your solution based upon this molarity and try to match the uh, concentrations of dissolved salts and other compounds in the patient's blood and you get it wrong then you, you shove too much into their system and you know and kill them so you need to know the but we're talking about osmosis here right? what's the osmotic pressure of your solution and it depends on what's dissolved in solution that's how what the molarity of potassium is how about the molarity of phosphate? Because it's going to stay whole. 
Well, there's only one of them, right? Right, so it's going to be the same. What's the total molarity of the solution? Of the ions in solution? Right, there's three here and one there, that's four. We break it up into four ions for every mole of the compound. So in that case, we would change this to four ions. And then whatever four times that would be. Okay. That's what we're trying to say here in that slide. <clears throat> if, we count, if we have a 0.25 molar calcium chloride solution, we're actually 0.25 molar in calcium, but we're 0.5 molar in chloride. Right? Okay. Feel like you're on a speeding train. <laughs> Don't stick your hand out the window, it might get slapped against the pole. All right. So which of the following solutions contains the greatest number of ions? All right, for this one, we want to uh, go to Henry Ford again. Okay, so we have 400 milliliters. Uh, yeah, four significant figures of 0 0.10 molar sodium chloride. Okay, greatest number of ions. So before we put the others up there, how would we calculate the number of ions here? Remember the, the uh, formula is number of moles divided by liters of volume. Okay? And that's like any math formula. We want to know how many moles. So we saw for this one, N equals molarity to volume. Uh, I think somebody dropped out and came back. Yeah, that's what happened. <clears throat> okay, so we multiply volume times molarity and we get the number of units, moles of sodium chloride. Now, here, here's a, don't freak out. <laughs> if we multiply 400 milliliters times 0.1 molar, we get millimoles. I know that that's strange, isn't it? Well, let me prove it to you. If I multiply 0.1 times 400, what do I get? 40.00, right? If I call that millimole, then suppose I want to reconstitute the molarity. If I divide moles by volume, millimoles by 400 milliliters, is that going to give me molarity? Look at it this way. What does that mean right there? Milli, milli. That's 10 to the minus 30, right? Really? That's 10 to the minus 30. But it's in top and bottom. They cancel. So it's moles divided by liters. And it gives me 0.1 mole. Okay? I guess in math they call that a proof. <clears throat> the reason I introduced that is because many times it's more convenient to just go ahead and multiply milliliters times molarity and work with millimoles until you have to do moles. That saves you a step. Okay, if we do it that way, and we do each one calculating millimoles, then we can compare millimoles. It's like comparing apples versus oranges. Right? I got all apples over here, all oranges over there, and I don't try to compare the two. We're fine. That's millimoles of compound. All right. Well, we're looking for the greatest number of ions. So if we've got, um, this is going to give us moles or millimoles of compound versus ions. So how many ions per compound? In this case, we have two. 
Okay. So that was 40 times two is 80, right? Millimolar uh, ions. Right, so that was A. Now we can do the rest of it. 300 milliliters, 200, and 800. All right, what do we have here? Calcium chloride, same concentration. They're all the same concentration. Well, this one's calcium chloride. This one is, this is iron three chloride. And this is sucrose. All right, let's save ourselves some work. No ions are gonna come out of sucrose. It's going to, it's an intact molecule. It stays that way in solution. So it's going to be zero. No ions there. So we can work on these. Now what we need to do is convert compound to ions. Okay. What's the ratio here? For every one compound, you get three ions, don't you? One, one cation and two anions. That's three. All right, so this is going to be uh, 30 times three is 90, correct? 90 millimoles of ions. And this is, I hear something. Oh, I was going in my head, sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, 20 times, there's four here, right? One iron and three chlorides. So four times 20 is eight. Okay. So this solution right here has the greatest number of ions. Okay. And how did we do that? Dimensional analysis. Right. Just like so chapter two, I think, got into dimensional analysis. All right, that's just reiterating uh, solving problems. And it's just making the point, the solution with the greatest number of ions is not necessarily the one that has the greatest volume or the highest concentration. Right? That's the greatest volume, well, and they're all the same concentration, but even if you did it with different concentrations, you'd still have to go through this to determine, uh, to answer that question. And by the way, um, I write a compound here, which is true, um, but I, I wanna make a distinction between this type of compound, which breaks up into ions, and we usually refer to them as, as formula units. Because remember, um, this is the simplest whole number ratio of sodium and chlorine in that cube. Right? The cube could be that big, it could be this big. So we don't write sodium with a subscript of 45 billion and chlorine with a subscript of 45 billion. Simplest whole number ratio, one to one, one to two, one to three. It's only the molecular compounds like water, sucrose, um, the subscripts actually mean they're the simplest whole number ratio, but they're also the number of atoms in the molecule. Okay. In case you run across formula unit, think ionic compounds. Okay, dilution. <clears throat> when I was working in uh, uh, <coughs> in soil. We would assess the fertility of soils very often simply by making up a, a solution, uh, a prescribed solution of some kind uh, that had been calibrated for a certain crop. And we would extract the soil with that solution and then analyze the components. Usually with a, um, let's see, at that time I was using an atomic absorption spectrophotometer. 
Uh, but now, and, and later, actually, when I was working out here at the uh, USDA, um, we had a, 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 a atomic absorption spectrophotometer, but, but we also had uh, and, uh, a, plectus, a plasma spectrometer, argon plasma spectrometer, which would analyze much faster. Anyway, um, when we extracted these uh, soils, we'd have hundreds of samples a day. I, I was just down the hall from the soil testing lab, and they used to do some of the testing for me, and I'd do some of my own testing because it was a specialty. But if it was like a uh, something that they did routinely, you know, I could give them my samples and they'd run them for me. But when you have that many samples and you need uh, lots of solution of a certain concentration, it's difficult to prepare that solution in sufficient quantities uh, if you make it from scratch, like from the solid uh, ionic compounds, dissolve them in water. Because some of them went into solution rather slowly. So what we would do was we would prepare a concentrated version where the ratio of all the components was exactly the same as the final. And then all we'd have to do is add more solvent to it, dilute it to down to the concentration that we wanted for the extraction. <clears throat> but this is why it works. You're adding a solvent to a concentrated solution to make a more dilute solution. And uh, let's look at it this way. Say we have a solution here. Right? And it has a concentration of some molarity. Okay. So it has moles per liter of a solute. And we want to dilute it down to, let's say, uh, one liter. And we use a volumetric flask. A volumetric flask is a very special piece of glassware which will contain exactly the volume that's uh, printed on the glass. In this case, we're going we're gonna to make it one liter. Right? So if we fill this up with water to that point right there, the bottom of the meniscus on that line, then we will have one liter. Whether it's pure water or a solution, it will still be one liter. Plus or minus, uh, let's see, class A glassware is like uh, 0 .0, 0.05 percent, I think. So it's, it's really accurate. Okay, this is our final volume. Our initial volume over here depends on how much of this we want to take out. Right? We don't want to take all of it out. I mean, if we put all of it over here, right, um, it may be too much or it may be too little, and we really don't know. Right? So we take out an exact amount. So out of here, we take out a volume of the solution, usually measured in milliliters, and usually with a volumetric pipette. It's a special device, like that's a special device. This, and it has a bulb here, and then it goes down here to a tin. Yeah. And marking right here. And depending on the pipette, it'll be a certain volume, say 10 milliliters, 25, 50, 100, whatever the case may be. Let's say it's uh, 100, say 100 milliliters. Okay? So if we use that and take out a volume here of 100, uh, 100 milliliters, okay? And we put it in here, right? Call that volume two. But actually, that's not volume two. This is volume two. That's volume one. That's volume two. We take out this exact amount, put it over here. The final volume will be volume two. Okay. What's the molarity? Well, it's what we want, or um, it's what we calculate. Now, how many, um, the relationship here is um, 
Remember, moles equals molarity times by right? one, one. So the number of moles coming out of here, we can calculate by the molarity and the volume we extract. Okay? Uh, we did that calculation before. The moles that we put in over here are also equal to that molarity times that volume. If we know the molarity, the final molarity times the total volume, we can calculate how many moles are actually in that container. Okay? So the moles, moles are the constant. The moles we take out here are the same moles we put in here. Exactly the same. Right? We pulled out a certain volume. That's this number of moles. Put it over here, same number of moles. So N1 equals N2. So remember the, the mathematical rule, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Right? If this one equals that and that one equals that, then those two are equal. M1, B1 equals M2, B2. That's where that formula comes from. Now, to use it, you only need to know three of those terms, and you can solve for the third one. Okay? Um, for my example, where I, we were diluting the solutions, we know, uh, we write it this way, the concentrated molarity, we know that. And, um, but we don't know how much of the volume to take out. But we do know our final volume here in this container, of the diluted volume, and we do know our target molarity. Okay, so now we know that one, that one, that one. We can solve what volume do I need to take out of this one to give me that molarity when I dilute it to that volume. That's how you use it. Questions? Or did I? Did I stun you? Have you have you done any dilution in your uh, jobs? No. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And here's an explanation for why it works in animated uh, PowerPoint form. Okay. So let's uh, stop for a moment and do a concept check. See, be sure we have a grasp of the, con of the concepts we've studied so far. If we have a 0 0.5 molar solution of sodium chloride in an open beaker, uh, I like to draw a picture. 0 0.5 molar sodium chloride solution. And this is aqueous. And it sits out on the lab bench. All right, what's going to happen? If we let it sit there long enough, the water's going to evaporate, right? Will the sodium chloride evaporate? No. It takes a, a pretty high temperature to get the sodium chloride to evaporate. Hundreds and hundreds of degrees. Okay. So which of the following would decrease the concentration of the solid? If we've got a certain amount of moles of sodium chloride in here, what would decrease its concentration? All right, look at it this way, moles per unit volume. If we want to decrease that number, we can do two things. We can either remove some of these, some of the sodium chloride, right, decrease the numerator, or increase the denominator, right, increase the volume. So add water to the solution, yeah, that'll decrease its concentration. Pour some of the solution down the drain, no, okay. no, because this is an intensive property. Doesn't matter how much we have, if we pour all of it but that much, we still got that concentration. Uh, add more sodium chloride, that goes the other direction. Okay. Uh, let the solution sit out on the open air for a couple of days, no, because you're removing volume. Make this smaller, that makes this bigger. Okay? We're talking math now. Or at least two of the above would decrease. No. Only one will decrease. 
and that's add more water, add more solvent. Okay. Doing all time. Yeah. Let's see where I am in my slides. If I need to, I do need to kick it up some. Okay, what's the minimum volume of two molar sodium hydroxide solution needed to make 150 milliliters of 0.8 molar sodium hydroxide solution? This looks like a dilution problem because you've got two concentrations and two volumes being discussed here. So uh, two molar sodium hydroxide is the concentrated molarity. We got a volume concentrated, we got a, a diluted volume, uh, molarity, and a diluted volume. It helps to put this stuff in a form, take it off the page, right? because word problems are designed to confuse. So take it off the page and put it up here so you can actually see what you've got and put it in the right place. Uh, we want to make 150 milliliters. Fine volume, and that concentration will be 0 0.8 molarity. Okay, this is the one we need to know what volume to take out of the concentrated solution and dilute it to this volume to make that concentration. So we would, we would uh, go back to our original formula or M1V1, it doesn't matter really. I'm going to use the same subscripts as I did over there just to avoid confusion. Concentrated, 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 dilute, dilute. Okay, so we're going to solve for this one right here. Over city. Okay. <clears throat> Notice. Now, what we have here are ratios, right? So, when, when you have this situation, you don't have to change the volume to liters because the liters are going to cancel. Molarity will cancel right here, and liters would cancel here, but milliliters will also cancel, right? So, we can save ourselves a step. All we have to do now is plug in the values, uh, diluted. 0 0.800 molarity times volume diluted, 150 milliliters divided by concentrated 2.31 molarity. So molarities cancel and leave us with milliliters. Okay. So what's, uh, anybody beat me to the punch? 0 0.8 times 150 divided by 2. Is 60. Let's say we've got three significant figures 60.0 milliliters. That's the volume of the concentrated solution we need to draw out. Am I animated? Yeah, somewhat. There you go. To use the unit millimoles, you couldn't do that there because the molarity cancels out. You wouldn't need to. No, I mean this actually calculates millimoles right here. That's okay. Yeah, I, that's what I put in my notes just then, and then I was like, wait a second. But in the process, molarities cancel anyway. So we're only interested in volume units. Volume unit there, volume unit here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But behind the scenes, that's what's happening. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Different types of reactions. Okay, <clears throat> the thing to, to remember here is that these are descriptive terms based upon the reaction itself, of course, but um, 
one reaction could fit into multiple classifications. And those will become obvious as we proceed. But the major types of reactions we identify are precipitation reactions. Precipitation reactions result from um, two or more solutions solutions combined and they produce a solid right if they're in solution right there's no solid but when you put them together the reaction produces a solid material that may look kind of um, milky foggy at first and then over time it'll settle out that's a precipitation reaction and the solid is called a precipitate And it's designated with that, right, that parentheses S when we write out the, the equation, which we'll do. Acid base reaction is just what it, that says. You're reacting an acid with a base. Remember when we were naming them, uh, I'm going to use hydrochloric acid as an example. And then sodium hydroxide as the base. We didn't need any special naming conventions for the bases, but right? you just, just name what they are. Sodium, that's a polyatomic ion, hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. But uh, hydrogen chloride in solution is called hydrochloric acid. Right? So the acids have a special naming convention, the bases don't. Okay, that's an acid base reaction, and it produces. You swap, you take this hydroxide and that hydrogen together, it makes water, right? Two hydrogens and one oxygen make water. That's a liquid. And then you take the cation and the anion together, and they're still in solution. That's an acid base reaction. Um, oxidation reduction reactions, we call them redox. Redox reactions. These are the kind where electrons are transferred from one atom to another. Right. Just transfer of electrons. And we're going to get into these. Right now, we're just describing them. We're going to get into actually doing reaction stoichiometry with these things later. Transfer electrons. Okay. We got other types, and these can be uh, these different types can be applied to a single reaction. Uh, you could have, uh, let's see. Well, a combination reaction is uh, a or a synthesis. They're they're synonymous. These two terms. You've got a uh, simple going to complex. And very often it's one element plus another element. That would be the simplest type of combination or synthesis reaction. And then decomposition is just the other way around. Decomposition. Doesn't it have another name? Decomposition or... I can't think of the other one. We would take that and go in reverse. Okay. Single displacement. Single displacement. Displacement. Reaction is where you have uh, an element and a compound. And the X replaces one of these things. Usually, it replaces the, uh, the cation. It's like a metal replacing this cation. Mm -hmm. So that in that case, it would be um, Y then would be the element left over, and X is the medium, would be the product. So they just swap places. A double displacement. Yeah. 
Double displacement is the next step up. Say we have this compound, and uh, let's do it this way. Let's say we have an A, B, and a C, D. Then the cation is swap places. Is the way I think of it. So A associates with D, and C associates with B. That double displacement. That type of reaction is very common for the precipitation type reactions. So you can have, that's one example where you can have, uh, this is also this type. This doesn't have to be that type, but if you have precipitation, it is a double displacement. And combustion. Combustion is a special kind a reaction where you have uh, some compound plus oxygen. That's required. You have to have oxygen to be a combustion. All right. Um, let's see, next Tuesday we'll do a review and we'll get into a bunch of examples of these types of reactions. So look at that review document. And you'll see a whole host of these examples to give you some uh, experience working with different types of reactions. All right, uh, double displacement. Uh, I already mentioned that, double displacement precipitation. Right? So we don't have to spend time on this slide. I've actually explained those. All right, if we take the precipitation out as a uh, as an example and look at that by itself, the precipitation here in this example, barium nitrate in aqueous solution and potassium chromate in aqueous solution, when they combine, Take the chromium, the barium, and combine it with the chromate, and the potassium, and combine it with the nitrate, and see what you get. Okay. This is one of those reactions where I might give you the reactants, but I don't give you the products because the products are, are easy to figure out. It's just a double displacement, and then you look to see if one of them will precipitate. Does it form a solid? Now, how do you know that? Well, I've got it up here, but you've also got a bigger one right here on the back of your review document. Okay. That chart tells you when you combine uh, one of these anions on the left with one of these cations on the top, then you just follow this one over until it meets that, and you see, is it grayed out? If it's grayed out, then it precipitates. If it's not grayed out, then it doesn't precipitate, it stays in solution. So that, that would be what we would find with uh, potassium nitrate. If you looked uh, potassium across here and followed the nitrate, it's clear, right? So uh, it stays in solution. But if you look up barium chromate, go across here until you find barium and drop down to chromate. Let's see, keep going, keep going. Chromate's at the bottom. There it is. It's grayed out. Okay. Now, all this writing down here, these are the rules that gave rise to the table. If you were chemistry majors, then I'd have you memorize those rules. And the rules are set up, if you're interested, they're set up so that number one rule takes precedence over anything below it. Two takes precedence in, against anything below it. They're in, in hierarchical order. So if you got to break a tie, then the rule above takes precedence. Uh, for example, the first rule is uh, compounds of group one elements, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, francium and ammonium, are all soluble, every one of them. So any compound with one of those alkali metals will be soluble. Uh, then the second one is nitrates. Nitrates, chlorates, perchlorates, and acetates are soluble, all of them. So we got a double whammy there, potassium or nitrate. Together, right, it has to be soluble. But the barium chromate is, uh, let's see, Chromium, chromium, 
Exatamente. Uh, all barium salts, with the exceptions of those rules above them, are insoluble. So, that type of reaction, first thing you want to do is, like any other reaction, write the compound correctly. If you're given the name, be sure you can write the compound. Then, um, for these types of reactions, you want to say, is it in solution? So, you want to put the parentheses AQ for aqueous. And if you see two salts like that, two, two uh, ionic compounds in aqueous solution, and nothing's given for the products, then you can be pretty sure that we're looking at a double displacement. And you just need to decide, is it going to produce a repaid precipitate by looking at that chart? Okay. They don't have roadmaps anymore, do they? Everybody's got things on their phone. Used to be, You'd have a road map. If you want to find the distance between two cities, there'd be a little chart at the bottom. And you, you, one city would be here, and the other city would be here, and you'd find where they meet, mileage. Um, okay. So that's a double displacement and a precipitate precipitation reaction. Oh, okay. I, I know I'm going to go over today, so if you have to leave, that's fine. But I will say, hold on a second, stop that. I will say that um, if you have to leave, then the lab that we're going to do next week, the um, Waters of Constitution and Hydration, we're not going to have time to do a pre-lab discussion, of, but there are actually two pre-lab discussions in Brightspace. Under that under that lab in that module, then you can you can get some insight about the lab ahead of time. And of course, I want you to fill out your notebook to be ready. Right? We talked about that at the very beginning. Okay, so let's see. What do we have here? There we had sodium chloride in one, silver nitrate in the other one. Now we're going to drop some of the so, so sodium chloride solution into the silver nitrate solution. So what would that look like? Sodium chloride plus silver nitrate okay, produces one. Okay, and stop. Well, the silver is going to combine with the chlorine and the sodium combined with the nitrate, right? It's a double displacement. So the sodium and the nitrate are soluble, right? Alkali metal and nitrate, both of them. So we know it's soluble. And then we go and look up silver chloride right, in that uh, chart. And we find that it's a solid. Right? So we wrote these correctly. We just need to see is it balanced? One sodium, one sodium, one chlorine. Chlorine, one silver, one nitrate. Okay, it's balanced just like it is. That's a double displacement reaction. And um, one, one that we're going to use, uh, hold on a second. I think we get to this one in the second semester where we actually do that reaction. Let's see if that right. Yeah, not until the second semester we, we use the precipitation reaction. Okay. So, um, if it's soluble, then we continue with the AQ. If that ionic compound is soluble, then we continue that way. Um, if it's insoluble, then we put an S there for solid. It may be suspended in the liquid temporarily, but over time, it will settle. Um, now, at this point, insoluble and slightly soluble are synonymous. <laughs> we know, and we're going to do in the second semester, 
that this silver chloride is very slightly soluble in water. And we know how to quantify that. But for now, let's just, this, uh, there's a, a black and white. It's either soluble or not soluble. Okay, for our purposes, for the immediate future. Let's see. Okay, these are those rules that I talked about that are at the bottom of that chart. Right? I just put them there for posterity. Which of the following ions form compounds with lead two plus ion that are generally soluble in water? Okay, in this case, all you have to do is take that um, chart. You got a lead two plus, and you find the lead two plus across the top. Lead two plus across the top, which is way out here toward the right. And then you go down and say, all right, where's the sulfide? Right? Insoluble. Uh, where's the chloride? Chloride's here, right? Insoluble. Nitrate, well, we know all nitrates are soluble, so we don't even have to look. <laughs> Nitrate is soluble. Sulfate, lead two plus and sulfate. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So, okay, so sulfate. There's sulfate. Yep. It's insoluble, forms a solid. And then the last one is a, a ringer. You don't form compounds with two cations, right? So the only one that's soluble is the um, nitrate. Rest of them are insoluble. Using that chart. All right. Now, when we write these balanced equations for um, for our precipitation reactions, uh, this is the one that. Um, that we just looked at in that video. This equation that we that we write there is sometimes called the molecular equation. Actually, prop more properly, it would be the formula equation because we don't have molecules there. We just we have ion ionic compounds. So the formula equation is complete. It has has everything in there, and nobody's separated as ions. We know that. This compound right here in solution is going to be silver ions and nitrate ions separated. We know that sodium and chloride ions are going to be separated in that aqueous solution. We know that in the as the product, sodium and nitrate ions are going to be separated in solution. The only one that's going to be solid is the silver chloride. But uh, this is easier to write and balance. But after you get that, after you get that equation balanced, this formula equation, then we can actually approach reality. And this is the complete ionic equation where we separate out the ions. Silver ions in solution, nitrate, sodium, and chloride ions in the reactants. They're all in solution. Then when they react, you get silver chloride, it's still solid, just like it was in the formula equation. But the sodium and the nitrate are still in solution. Okay, that's the complete ionic equation. Now, what can we do with that one? Well, if we want to simplify it, right, you've got nitrates on the left and nitrates on the right in the same uh, molar amounts with the same coefficients. They can cancel out. You can do the same thing with the sodium. Get rid of the sodium. So now what do you got left? What you have left is this. That's the net ionic equation. Right? We just canceled out the things that are still in solution on both sides. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, there's several reasons. One of the most practical reasons is if, uh, say, I want to set up a lab for you guys to, to do this reaction. But um, strangely enough, I don't have any sodium chloride in my store. Well, all I need is a compound that we're going to solution and produce 
uh, chloride ions, but the the companion cation can be anything as long as it stays in solution on the product side. So any one of those um, alkaline metals will work, like lithium, potassium, rubidium, chloride, any of those will work, and we get the same reaction. Okay. That's just one reason. Those ions that we canceled are called spectators. They're just sitting around watching things happen. The thing that, that actually drives the reaction to completion is this part. Like when you form that solid, it drops out of solution. It drops out of the reaction mixture. And when it does that, it can't go backwards. For our purposes now. We'll qualify that later. <clears throat> but um, did we discuss driving forces for reactions? We didn't. I do that in the introductory course. I don't know why I do it, didn't do it in this one. There are various driving forces that, that cause a reaction to move. One is the formation of a precipitate. The other is the formation of a gas. If you form a gas, rather than make a solid, the gas goes, it's gone. It's not in the reaction mixture anymore, so it's, it's pulling the reaction in that direction. Um, the other is uh, formation of water in aqueous solutions, acid-base reactions. If you form water, it goes into the solvent and pulls the reaction in that direction. And uh, let's see, there's a fourth one, but I, my mind's gone blank. There are various driving forces. Okay, so here's an example where you have cobalt chloride and sodium hydroxide. Got to go. Are you getting ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me see. How much more do I have to go? Quite a bit. Yeah, a few slides. Okay. I'm going to finish it since there's nobody coming in after us. Um, this is an example where cobalt chloride, cobalt 2 chloride, and sodium hydroxide react and produce cobalt hydroxide as the precipitate. We write the balanced equation, then we spread everything out into its ions, then we cancel the spectators, and that's what you need to be able to do. And there are a couple of examples in the review document that will give you practice. Okay. Um, Stoichiometry. Now, we talked about limiting reactants last time. You can have limiting reactants in any reaction. And uh, to solve a stoichiometry problem for solutions, uh, you follow some of the similar procedures. One is you identify the species that are present and combine in solution. Right? And you, you write the balanced equation. Um, you can either write the, the entire equation or you can write the net ionic equation and um, it, it'll work either way. Then you have to calculate the number of moles that you have of the reactants. And say um, which one then is, if you have uh, amounts for both uh, the reactants, then you also have to say which one is limiting. The one that's limiting is the one that's going to run out, and it dictates when the reaction stops. Using that information, once you know the limiting reactant, you can calculate the moles of the product, and then you can convert back into some um, usable form, either grams. If it's a precipitate, definitely you'll calculate the, the uh, grams of the product, or if it's another reaction, then what they may want you to calculate is what's the concentration of product in solution. Right? And there's your, your chart that's in the review document right there. So let's say we have a, um, we have this reaction. We have a uh, sodium phosphate solution. Right? What does sodium phosphate look like? Sodium 
and phosphate, right? Remember, this is a plus one, that's a minus three. So we need three of those. And we're told it's in solution, right? So it's aqueous. In, in our case, we're using aqueous solutions. And we also have lead to nitrate as a reactant. Lead two plus, because it says so right there in the name. And then nitrate, which is a minus one charge. So we need two of these. There we go. So now we've written our compounds correctly. What are they going to produce? Well, um, the question, first question is what precipitate will form? So this being a double displacement reaction, we would combine this one with that and this one with that. Sodium nitrate is going to be soluble. We know that because it's an alkali metal and a nitrate. So it's definitely going to be soluble. So let's see, is lead to lead two plus and phosphate three minus. Right? We haven't written that one correctly yet. When you have uh, an even and an odd charge to balance, cross multiplication is your best bet. Bring that three over here, bring that two over here. Now we've written it correctly and we need to check we need to check our um, solubility chart. Let's see, I can back up there. So we look up lead. Let's see, lead is lead two plus is right here. And then we follow it down until it meets the phosphates. So we keep going, keep going, phosphate, PO4, right down here. It's grayed out. So this one is a solid. Okay. That answers the first question. What precipitate will form? Now, um, I did it by writing out the equation. But if the question is simply what solid forms, all you need to do is say, well, we've got sodium ions, we've got phosphate ions, We've got lead two plus ions and we've got nitrate ions. Right? Actually, you can do it this way. Let's leave those two, let's see, those two there. Right? And let's put the cations down this side. Like that. All right. Sodium and phosphate, we've already got that one. We know it's soluble. Uh, sodium and nitrate, when they combine, they're going to be soluble also. Lead and phosphate, we know that's going to be a solid. And lead and nitrate, we already know that one is like that. So we know that this one, so lead to phosphate is going to be the precipitate. Right. All right. The balanced molecular equation, right? So we can go from where I left off with this equation. And you can either use the budgeting method that I showed you last time. Um, or most of these double displacement reactions are, are really simple to balance. You just count up the parts. We have three sodiums here. We need three there. Now we have three nitrates. Uh, okay, this is not going to be as easy as I thought. All right, let's go back to the budget. All right, we've got sodium, phosphate, I'm not going to put the charge in, lead, and nitrate. Now, can I do that? Yeah, phosphate stays the same on both sides. Nitrate stays the same on both sides. But we can use those as our balancing units. All right, this side we have three, uh, three sodiums, one phosphate, one lead, and two nitrates. On this side we have one sodium, we have two phosphates, we have three leads, and we have one nitrate. Okay. Now what we need to do 
is decide where do we want to start? Well, um, I find that when we have this type of reaction, where there's a precipitate, start with components of the precipitation. Uh, we have three leads over here. We need three leads over here. Right here. Let's say three leads here. So that gives us three. It gives us six nitrates. Okay. Now we can balance the nitrates over here. We need six nitrates, right? Six nitrates. But that gives us six sodiums as well. Okay. Now we need six sodiums. So we put a two here. That gives us six sodiums and two phosphates. Six, two, three, six. Now we're balanced. Okay. That's the balanced formula equation or molecular equation, whichever I'm not particular about whether you use one or the other. What are the moles of reactants present in the solution? Okay, now we have to go back to the, um, the problem and put in some more information. Now that we have a balanced equation, let's add information that's given in the problem. We have 10 milliliters of 0.3 molar sodium phosphate. 10 milliliters of 0 0.3 molar sodium phosphate. And we have 20 milliliters of 0 0.2 molar lead nitrate. Okay. With that, in the parentheses, it says, assume no volume change. What can happen when you put two solutions together is they can either be more volume than the summation of the two, or they can be less volume than the summation of the two. But for, for our purposes here, we're going to assume that there's no change in volume. So the total volume would be what? 10 plus 20 is 30 milliliters. Now let's go back to the question. There we go. What are the moles of reactants present in the solution? So the moles of reactants are simply molarity times volume. And we're gonna we're gonna go with millimoles for now. Right? So 0.3 times 10 is uh 3.00 millimoles of that reactant, and this is four point yeah, four point zero zero millimoles of that reactant. Okay, three and four. That's right. Now which reactant is limiting? Here's how you determine the limiting reactant. Um, well, actually, there are two ways, and it depends on what the final question is. Do you need to know how much solid is produced? If that's the case, then you take this, milli this number of moles of that and use the coefficients as a conversion factor to find out how many moles would that produce if all of it were used. You do that for both reactants. Okay. The other way is to say, all right, if this is equivalent to two, then is that equivalent to three? You say, if this is equivalent to, to two, then we do a conversion from here to here, and that would work also to find the limiting reactant. But since we're, we're probably going down to the solid, let's do it this way. Find out how many millimoles of product Will this produce if all of it is reactive? Okay, so 3.00 millimoles of sodium phosphate, and we use a conversion factor that's built from the coefficients. Right? We want to know lead 3 phosphate, right? and 
That has a coefficient of one. And we want sodium phosphate in the new in the denominator. That has a coefficient of two. So this would produce uh, 1.50 millimoles of product. Okay, how about this one? If we used four millimoles uh, of, excuse me, of lead to nitrate, and we built our conversion factor from here, lead to nitrate, that and we want to end up with the same product, then we have the same coefficient for that one. But this one has a coefficient of three. So three and the four is what? Right. What's four thirds? One and one third, right? So it's 1.33 on out. Right. So, this amount, if all of it is used, will produce 1.33 millimoles of product. All of this, if it were used, would produce more. So, the limiting reactant is this one right here. It produces the least amount, so it runs out first. And this one is excess. Okay. And looks like that's the way we did it in the slide. Okay. So lead nitrate runs out first, and that's the limiting reactant. How many moles of this will be formed? Well, it's, uh, let's see, this, this many millimoles will be formed. But if it asks you for moles, how do you get millimoles, moles out of millimoles? Actually, it's really easy. What does milli mean? Milli means 10 to the minus 3. One point three three times 10 to the minus 3rd, moles. What mass will be formed? Okay. When you when you use when you're converting moles to grams, you can't use millimoles, right? Because molar mass is in terms of uh, grams per mole. So you you will have to convert to moles in order to use the conversion factor. Which is the molar mass of that compound. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to say it's uh, 811.54. 81154 grams per mole times 1.33 times 10 to the minus third moles, and that's 1.08 grams. So, this precipitation reaction will produce 1.08 grams of product under those conditions. All right. Now, while we've got that up there, the next question is, what's the concentration of nitrate ions left in solution after the reaction is complete? <coughs> well, notice, nitrate is aqueous. All of the nitrate is still there. The only difference is the volume has changed. So how many moles of nitrate did you start with? Right. Well, we started with here 1.33 times 10 to the minus third moles, actually 1.33 millimoles of compound. Of uh, lead to nitrate. How many nitrate ions would that represent? Well, for every one compound, 
you have two nitrates. So you actually have 2.67, right? Because this goes on out like that. Millimoles of nitrate. Okay. That's the number of moles. What's the volume? If we divide moles by volume, millimoles by milliliters. This one plus this one. So we divide by 30 milliliters. And that will give us the concentration of 0.27, is it? Let's see. Let me check that to be sure it's right. 2.67 enter in 30 divide. Uh, hold on a second. Concentration of nitrate ions left in solution after the reaction is complete. Uh, one point. Oh, hold on a second. I made boo boo. This is how many millimoles of lead to nitrate there are. So times two equals eight millimoles of nitrate. There we go. Now we divide that by volume, 30 milliliters. Okay, and that's equal to 0 0.27 molar nitrate. Here we go. What's the concentration of phosphate ions left in solution? In this case, we have uh, three millimoles of phosphate because there's one of these for every one of those. So this is three millimoles of phosphate ions to start. How many of them were used up? Well, we've got um, we've got this many millimoles of uh, uh, excuse me uh, phosphate here. Out of this three millimoles. We used up 1.33 millimoles of, of a compound, 1.33 millimoles of yeah, we produced that much of this compound. Like that. Okay. How many millimoles? Of phosphate does that represent? Because that's how much now is tied up in the solid. So with two of these for every one of those, that's 2.67 millimoles of phosphate used. Right? So out of the three millimoles, we used up 2.67 millimoles. Right? So we have three and six and nine is three. I think that's right. Yeah. This remains in solution. So to calculate the concentration, we want 0 0.33 millimoles of phosphate divided by 30 milliliters. Okay. And that will give us 0 0.011 molar phosphate. Okay. All right. So that's stoichiometry of a precipitation reaction.
Now we want to look at an acid base reaction. Now we haven't talked about acid bases um, in detail, and we actually don't get to those until uh, I think next semester. Yeah. Okay, so now when I mentioned Bronsted Lauer, that's a certain type of, of uh, acid base. And uh, we'll get more detail next semester, but for now, acids are proton donors. So when we write an acid like this, it's an acid because it can donate that proton. And this is a base because that negative can accept this positive, right? Those two together will produce water. So this is a proton acceptor. This is a proton donor, acid base, all right? Now, uh, if we use what we've learned so far about um, formula equations, complete ionic equations, and net ionic equations, we could write it this way, right? HCl plus sodium hydroxide aqueous yields uh, water liquid plus sodium chloride aqueous, right? In solution, this ion is separated from that ion, and this ion is separate from this ion. And they produce water, and that is not broken apart. And they also produce sodium ions and chloride ions as products. Okay? That's the net. This is the formula equation. This is the net ionic equation. Uh, excuse me. This is the complete ionic equation. And this is the net ionic equation. This is a spectator. These two are spectators. So what do you have left? You have left over this one. Protons plus hydroxyl ions. And they produce water. That's what drives this reaction, the production of water. And that's the net ionic equation for a strong base and a strong acid reaction. Okay. And what we mean by that is the strong acids completely dissociate in aqueous solution. Strong bases completely dissociate in solution, in aqueous solution. Oh, we got another video. Hydrochloric acid contains hydrogen ions and chloride ions in aqueous solution. Sodium hydroxide contains sodium ions and hydroxide ions in aqueous solution. When these two solutions combine, a neutralization reaction takes place. In this reaction, hydrogen ions from the acid and hydroxide ions from the base combine to form water molecules. The sodium and chloride ions are unaffected and remain to form a neutral sodium chloride solution. Neutralization can be summed up by this simple ionic equation. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, for stoichiometry of acid base reactions, they're really very simple. You got to identify what's the acid, what's the base, and they always form water. Right? The acid plus the base. Always combine to form water plus a salt. And in chemical terms, the combination of the cation and the anion from the acid and the base 
is termed a salt. So it could be potassium chloride, it could be uh, any combination is called a salt. That is the chemical definition of a salt, the product of an acid-base reaction. Uh, so you write the equations, then you, you do the same thing as before. You calculate the moles of reactants, you determine the limiting reactant, you calculate the moles of the required reactant to form the product, and then you convert uh, into uh, either, sometimes the salt precipitates and sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it doesn't, but um, you follow the same stoichiometric procedure as we did for the precipitation reaction. You find out which one is limiting, and the limiting one determines how much product you get. Now, one thing that we do with acid-base reactions is called a titration. Now, this is an acid-base titration. There are a whole bunch of different types of titration. And it's based upon the concept, titration is based upon the concept that you know how much there is of one reactant. You want to find out how much there is of the other reactant based upon their reaction equation. And by doing that, you can, um, you can determine the concentration of your unknown solution. What you need to reach is called an equivalence point. The equivalence point is where the uh, moles of one reactant equals the moles of the other reactant in terms of protons and hydroxyls. Okay, that's important because if this acid is, say, sulfuric acid, it produces two hydrogens. So the stoichiometry, the, the ratio is going to be different because this one produces two. Now you're going to need twice as much sodium hydroxide. So you need to know the balanced equation to determine um, the stoichiometry of the reaction. That would be the equivalence point. Now, as a practical matter, we uh, when we have uh, hundreds of these titrations to do. Uh, it's difficult to find the equivalence point easily using um, laboratory equipment, but if you have an indicator, uh, a, a material that you can add to the solution, and when you reach or get very close to the equivalence point, the, in, the indicator changes colors, and you can see it. Uh, you Usually, if you choose them correctly, you can get very close to the equivalence point, so close that the calculation uh, is in error by less than the tenth of a percent. So that's the equivalence point is the actual chemistry when they're when the moles are equal. The end point is the is the uh, point at which the indicator tells you you've reached very close to the equivalence point. That's the difference between the two. All right, so for a titration of sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide, how convenient. Let's say we've got this one, I'll just put it down here. H2SO4. Now what we need to do is um, balance the equation. If you've got two hydrogens here and only one hydroxyl, we need two hydroxyls to make two waters. And then we're going to have two sodiums here and not chloride. <laughs> now we're going to have sulfate and two sodiums because sulfate is a two minus charge. Okay. And this is uh, still an aqueous solution. All right. That's a balanced equation. Uh, hold on a second. We don't need two here. My mistake. Only one. We need two sodiums there, two here, one sulfate, one sulfate. Um, four hydrogens. Two times that one is four hydrogens. That's two plus two is four, and two oxygens here. Okay. So I just check myself, be sure it's balanced now. 
Now the question is, for a titration of sulfuric acid with sodium hydroxide, how many moles of sodium hydroxide would be required to react with one liter of 0.5 molar sulfuric acid? Okay, so we can remove this. And we have one liter of what? 0.5 molar sulfuric acid. Okay, and uh, the concentration of, well, we don't need another concentration of this one. How many moles of this one will be required to react with that? So this gives us molarity times volume is 0 0.500 moles of sulfuric acid. Okay. How many moles of sodium hydroxide do we need? Well, the ratio is this one to that one. And we've got a two here, right? And a one there. So that equals one mole of sodium hydroxide is required to react with a half a mole, of, uh, one liter at a half a mole of sulfuric acid. Notice that it takes twice as much of this to react with that. Right. Half a molar, actually a half a mole of this requires a mole of sodium hydroxide because of the ratio, the balanced equation tells us that. All right, redox reactions. Redox reactions are reactions in which one or more electrons are transferred during the reaction. So let's get off of this wagon and get on to the redox re reactions. That's oxidation reduction, in which we transfer electrons. Um, one way Remember I said that some reactions can be categorized in two or more places. This is one of those cases. Combustion reactions are always redox. And reactions where Um, reactions where an element on one side ends up in a compound on the other side. Right. So this element reacts with something and it ends up in a compound over here. Um, good example of that is the single replacement reactions. Where you have uh, an element here plus um, a compound here and on this side, you wind up with an XZ and then an element there. In order for that to happen, electrons must be transferred. Sodium and chlorine, that's a good example. This is a synthesis reaction. Solid sodium plus chlorine gas yields sodium chloride solid. Okay? So we have two symbols makes a compound complex. That's a synthesis or a combination reaction. Notice when we use when we used to write the elements right like this, it has no it's neutral, no charge. No charge. Right? Neutral atoms, no charge. But in the compound, sodium has a plus one charge, chlorine has a minus one charge. So how did they get there? Well, as a matter of fact, electrons were transferred from sodium to chlorine to make this one negative and that one positive. That's why this is a, um, a, a redox reaction. 
because electrons have been transferred. Now, how do we deal with, how do we find out uh, more complex reactions are either redox or not? Well, we need some rules. We need some rules for assigning what we call oxidation states. Now, sometimes the oxidation state is a true ionic expression, like sodium and chlorine. Those are true ions. Sodium is a plus one charge, chlorine is a minus one charge. But we can do this with molecular compounds where there is no ion, like H2O would be an example. It's a molecular covalent compound, and there are no ions in the compound. But we assign values of oxidation states to them so that we can keep track of the movement of electrons. This is called, I call it a bookkeeping scheme. Right? You're, you've got balance sheets for the movement of electrons. And in order to do that, now we need rules. Okay. First rule is oxidation state of an element is always zero. So if we write it like this, say sodium metal, its oxidation state is zero. Or if we write chlorine, gas, right, that's a diatomic, then its oxidation state is zero. If we have ions, the oxidation state of that is plus one. The oxidation state of that one is minus one. Those are the easy ones. When we have oxygen in a covalent compound like water, it's always a minus two. The only time oxygen is not a minus two in a covalent compound is when it's part of a peroxide. So the best example of a peroxide is on your medicine in your medicine cabinet at home, hydrogen peroxide. This is hydrogen peroxide, and it's written like this. Okay, that's the structure. Notice that these two together are two minus. So each one has to be a one minus. Okay, that's the only time that we're concerned with where oxygen is not a minus two. It's when it's part of a peroxide. In covalent compounds also, hydrogen is a plus one. Okay, and the oxidation states behave as if they were charges so in a neutral compound like this, the oxidation states have to add up to zero. So two times that is two plus, or one times that is two minus, that's zero. Right? So neutral compounds, the oxidation states must add up to zero. Um, that's hydrogen in covalent compounds. When hydrogen is the first element in the compound. Okay. Um, fluorine. Fluorine is a halogen, and we always assign fluorine a minus one oxidation state when it's in a compound. When it's not in a compound, when it's like an element, right? It's zero. Um, six, we've already talked about that. Sum of oxidation states equals zero. The sum of oxidation states for um, polyatomic ions must be equal to the charge on the ion. Right? So uh, let's take this one, OH minus. That's a polyatomic hydroxyl ion. Oxygen is going to be minus two. Hydrogen is going to be plus one. These two together equals a minus one. All right. Those are the rules. Now let's see if we can calculate. The reason we need these rules is so that we can, we have an anchor point. Those that have fixed values, then we can, we can work through and calculate the values of oxidation states for the other elements in any compound. Right. So our example here is K2CRK 
2, Cr2O7, that's a polyatomic ion, dichromate. So this is potassium dichromate. And potassium's an alkali metal. They're always plus one. I don't know if we did that one already, but it's true. Let me see. Is that part of the list? Uh, no, it's missing. Alkali metals are always plus one. That's another rule that I left out. Oxygen is minus two. Okay. So two times a plus one is a plus two. Seven times a minus two is a minus 14. So we have a minus 12 there. That minus 12 must be balanced by what's left over. So this one must be a plus 12, but there are two of them, right? So each one is a plus six. We've just calculated the oxidation state of chromium in that compound. Okay, how about carbonate? It's a polyatomic ion. Oh, I almost missed Kathy. Let's see, did uh, Mr. Moose show up? I don't think so. So we want to calculate carbon because we know what oxygen is supposed to be. Oxygen is minus two. So minus two times three is minus six. Okay. But if we make carbon a plus six, we would say that this is neutral, but it's not. It has that extra two pluses. I mean, two minuses. So let's hold out two of these minuses. Okay. Those two minuses now are reserved for the charge. And we only have to balance that minus four. So this plus four will balance it and give us the two minus charge for the carbonate ion. And we can check ourselves, right? Let's do it. This is a two minus for the whole thing. All right. So if this one is a minus two, that means minus six, and a plus four yields minus two. Same as the charge. Okay. Let's see. In the interest of time, um, manganese four oxide is that PCL five. Okay. Here's one. PCL5. We don't have a rule for either phosphorus or chlorine. So what we have to do is decide which one are we going to go with. And when you've got um, a nonmetal attached to a halogen, we generally go with the halogen as fixed at minus one. So that's minus five. That means this one has to be a plus five for phosphorus. There you go. Now, um, sulfur tetrafluoride, we have a rule for that. One. It's minus one for this fluorine, so minus four total. That's a plus four for the sulfur to give us a neutral compound. Now, what do you do when you've got two halogens combined? Let's right, say so you have, um, oh, like that compound. Well, in that case, we go with the one that has a rule, fluoride or fluorine. This is a minus one. Okay. So that's a minus one. And this has to be a plus one. Well, that's a bad example. <laughs> I'm going to come out with a fraction. Uh, let's try it again. How about we do it like this? Um, how about three? So minus one here, minus three there. That means this chlorine is plus three. Okay. All right, so there are lots of examples in your review document for practicing these calculations, and you should, you ought to practice them until you're good at it. Um, okay, now it, we mentioned oxidation reduction and redox reactions are transfers of electrons, but we didn't say what those words mean. Oxidation means 
let's let's use this um, uh, acronym. Oil rig, oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. So if something is oxidized, it loses electrons. Loss of electrons. If it's reduced, then it's a gain of electrons. Okay? Also, uh, let's see. Let me check, see if I have a slide on this one. Uh, no. Okay. So let's say we have, um, well, let's just use the simplest one we've got. Sodium plus chlorine yields sodium chloride. All right. We're going to need two of these, two of those. All right. If this one's zero, mountain zero, this one's a plus one, that's a minus one, then what happened to the sodium? Loss. One electron per sodium times two equals two electrons. Chlorine gain. One electron per chlorine times two uh, equals two electrons. So since sodium lost electrons, it was oxidized. And chlorine was reduced. Okay. Now, what caused sodium to be oxidized? Chlorine did. Chlorine caused the oxidation. So chlorine is the oxidizing agent. And on the flip side, sodium is the reducing agent. Reducing agents are oxidized because they donate electrons to the other species and cause it to be reduced. All right, that's what we mean by those terms. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we're coming down to the wire now. Which of the following are oxidation reduction reactions? Identify the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. All right, need some space. Actually, I'm going to erase that too. So the first one, zinc solid plus two hydrochloric acid yields zinc chloride in solution plus hydrogen gas. All right. Now, if we're just trying to determine which one's a redox reaction, we can use that rule, the trick. We've got a metal or a, uh, an element over here, and it ends up in the compound. This is a redox reaction. Or hydrogen is a compound here, but it's an element over here. We know it's an oxidation reduction reaction. But the question also asks us which one is the oxidizing agent and which one's the reducing agent. So we have to do, we have to determine oxidation states and track the movement of electrons. That's an element. That's an element. This is a plus one, that's a minus one. This is a minus one, this is a plus two. Okay? So what happened to the zinc? Zinc lost two electrons for every zinc uh, times one equals two electrons total. Which one of these? Well, chlorine didn't change. Chlorine is still a minus one. Hydrogen changed. 
Okay? So hydrogen gained one electron per hydrogen times two equals two electrons. Notice that the oxidation step and the reduction step must balance the same amount of electrons. Now, you can't have any excess electrons because in, in normal chemistry, we don't allow for electrostatic charge to build up. Okay. Um, so the question is, which one is the oxidizing agent? Which one's the reducing agent? The oxidizing agent is the one that's reduced. This one. This is the oxidizing agent. And this is the reducing agent because it was oxidized. Okay. Let's see if we're animated. Okay, that's an oxidizing. Okay. Um, the middle one, dichromate, and we're only using the ions here. We've left out the uh, spectators. Dichromate plus hydroxyl yields chromate plus water. And if we go in there and, and do our budgeting, we'll find that there was no transfer of electrons. So B is not a redox reaction. But C is. Right? We know C is because copper is in the compound on the reactant side, and some of the copper is in uh, elemental form on the product side. We know electrons had to be transferred. Okay, so we've got two CuCl's aqueous yields CuCl2 in aqueous solution plus copper metal. Notice that these coppers came from the same source. Right? So one of these coppers went from minus one plus one to minus one plus two. It went from plus one plus two. It was oxidized or I should say loss one electron per copper. And the other, notice there are two here, two coppers. The other copper went to here. This is zero. So it went from a plus, plus one to a zero. It gained, it gained one electron per copper. So the oxidizing agent is the same as the reducing agent. One of these is the oxidizing agent. The other one is the reducing agent to produce that product and that product. This is called a disproportionation reaction. There we go. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is balancing equations that are redox. Some redox uh, reactions can be balanced by our simple budget method. But sometimes it's easier and more efficient, actually, to balance the equation first uh, in terms of its oxidation and reduction steps. And then finish it off with the budget. All right, so that's what we want to do first. Write the unbalanced equation and then determine, is it a redox reaction? If it is a redox reaction, then track the electrons and make the electrons balance right, with coefficients. Let's see if we have an example here. Uh, solid zinc and aqueous hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid. Solid zinc and aqueous, obviously, that's redundant, hydrochloric acid yields what? It's a sim, uh, single replacement reaction. So zinc chloride, need two of those, in aqueous solution plus hydrogen gas. 
Okay. Uh, and it, the reason I know this is too is because the name of the compound is zinc two chloride. Right? I know the charge here is two plus and one minus, so that balances it. Okay, so we write the equation first. Um, I think what. Uh, Okay, we're going to write the complete ionic equation. So let's take it over here. Okay? Let's take this one. 2 plus aqueous and chloride aqueous. There we go. Okay. Now we want to balance that uh, using a redox method. So what we have to do is determine the oxidation states. That's an element. That's an element. Those are charges. This one is a minus one. This is a plus one. Okay. So what's what? Well, zinc is changing its oxidation state. Okay. Loss. Two electrons per zinc. Okay. Chloride is not changing. So we don't have to deal with chloride yet. Hydrogen, though, gain one electron per hydrogen. <coughs> okay. That's the first thing we do. Oxidation states. Then we draw in our tie lines and say, what happened? All right. Next. Next, we want to be sure that the total number of electrons transferred is the same. Well, this one has two electrons transferred. This one only has one. But we do have two hydrogens here. Right? So if we multiply times two, that means this one has to be two. Two hydrogens, two hydrogens. Uh, equals, excuse me, equals two electrons. There we go. So now we have total number of electrons is balanced. Let's see. And there we go. Okay. Um, let's see. Is that completely balanced? Well, let's look. One zinc, one zinc. Two hydrogens, two hydrogens. Two chlorines. Nope, we need two chlorines. There we go. Now it's balanced. And I think that's the next animated. There we go. So this was a very, very simple example of balancing using redox. Use the redox first and uh, balance the electrons. And then if there's anything left over for budgeting, then you change the coefficients to match up. And that's what we did here. We did that change to make the electrons balance. We did this change to make the budget work. Okay, that's it. And we're only an hour over. So next Tuesday, we'll, uh, we'll do a review on chapters three and four during class. And then we'll go into the lab and, um, and conduct the um, Waters of Constitution and Hydration Lab. So we're going to be working with um, hot stuff, a Bunsen burner. Right? So you have to be careful with that. Be sure and... And come prepared with your lab coat, closed toed shoes, covered legs, and uh, I'll supply the gloves and if you need uh, eye protection. That's it. And away we go.